So um, welcome. And uh, here we are. I hope everybody's uh, comfortable at home, I suppose. But what I'm going to try and do is take you through my own personal scientific approach to what procedures I believe are used in what situations. And the reason for developing this talk in the first place, um, and you have to take it the context of my financial disclosures, um, is because I believe that different manufacturers um, within our refractive surgery industry um, are often painting things with a way too wide brush. They're telling us that all patients should be treated by trans-PRK. Oh, right, the vast majority of patients is the best procedure. The vast majority of patients would do better with wavefront guided. The vast majority of patients would be better with topo guided. The vast, there's, a, there's a company that tells you that, you know, the best procedure is SMILE. Um, and there is a company that tells you that the best procedure is a fake eye well, and there's really uh, the ICL, the IPCL, and uh, and the ICRIL, uh, fake it. So they'll tell you that everyone should be treated with that. And so clearly, um, either only one company is right, or nobody is right. And I think nobody is right. I think that companies are obviously always going to market their procedures with their own strengths. Um, and they're going to maybe stretch the truth. Uh, but I think as doctors and, and clinician scientists, we have to evaluate these materials and decide whether it really is appropriate or whether one procedure might actually be better than the other. And if you have access to all the options, then you might parse which procedure you deliver according to the evidence that you have. So obviously, what I'm presenting to you today is my opinion. Um, and you might disagree with it, and I, I look forward to your questions and complaints at the end if you do disagree, because it's the discussion that generates the best, um, um, I, I think, the best outcomes and results. So let's talk first about TransPRK. And this is a procedure which uh, was marketed as a new thing a few years ago, but in fact, it is the oldest thing. Um, because PRK, as you know, was the first way x was reused. And I happened to be in Vancouver um, still when Don Johnson was practicing. And he actually was the first one to popularize the idea of doing a transepithelial PRK, and he called it no-touch PRK. Um, I, will, I will hopefully take you through the steps for you to understand why he abandoned trans-PRK um, as the ideal procedure. Um, and return to advanced PRK. Now, to understand trans-PRK, you have to understand the epithelium. And many of you know that, well, I made a career out of measuring the epithelium. I was the first one to do so in 1991 in three dimensions. And so understanding the average profile of the epithelium is, is the beginning. So the average profile, which we published in the JRS, um, uh, over a decade ago, shows that with one micron precision using high-frequency ultrasound, that the central epithelial thickness is about 50 microns, and that is in every textbook. You can, you can go to textbooks from 100 years ago, and they said the same thing. But all of the textbooks, until our measurements started to be published, said that it was an even layer throughout. And trans-PRK trans or no-touch PRK, these were... It originally relied on the assumption that the epithelium is one layer thick the whole way through. Because you can imagine that in an average eye like this, because the epithelium is thinner above than it is below, and because it's thicker nasally than temporally, and as you can see, there's mirror symmetry to this, which we believe is all, all to do with the eyelid uh, forces on the upper part of the cornea, creating more thinning than the lower part where the eyelid is is not the, the eyelid forces is looser there isn't as much there isn't as much of a blinking motion but you can imagine that a trans prk on this average profile the epithelium will break through above here first but there'll still be about 10 microns 
of epithelium down here. So while you're cutting your myopic sphere here, you're only getting half of the myopic sphere being delivered up here, but not into the stroma here until you get down to 10 microns and you've taken away all the epithelium. So in fact, you're gonna get more ablation superiorly than inferiorly, and that means you're going to induce tilt or coma into this eye. So for the average eye, a trans PRK will induce more tilt or coma. And we expect that, I would expect that. Now, when we look at our publication where we, we selected 15 randomly selected profiles from our 110 eyes that we present, that we did statistics on, and we pick some ex other examples, in this example, you can see that the breakthrough is gonna happen above and below, and that this central saddle area, which is almost linear, is gonna be the last to be, uh, cut out. So in the meantime, you're going to be ablating superiorly and inferiorly, and that's going to give us a hyperopic cylinder induced into the cornea. Let's pick another profile. In this eye, the epithelium is 50 microns in the middle, but it's about 64, up to 64 microns in a ring pattern around. So here you're going to break through first in the middle, and then progressively, you're going to take out the epithelium as we go out to the periphery, but you're basically adding, cent you're subtracting cent of a peripheral ablation from the intended ablation profile. It'll give you more spherical aberration, it'll give you a smaller optical zone, and it will give you a hyperopic shift, whereas this one will give you a myopic cylindrical shift. So you see, it actually makes no sense whatsoever to do trans-PRK in most eyes, unless you have an exact 3D map of the epithelium and you have the ablation depth, the ablation rate differences between epithelium and stroma, which, which are characterized, but there is variation within the population. If you have all that data, trans epithelial PRK would make sense. And there are some advantages to trans-PRK in that you are only removing epithelium from the zone that you're doing the surgery. In. So clearly the wound is gonna be, have a smaller surface area and it'll heal faster. But if you look at the literature on this, it's interesting because um, if we just take our uh, epithelial profiles and look at the power distribution in the epithelium in the normal population. We presented this at Arvo in 2011. We haven't actually managed to get around to writing it up yet, but we will. Um, what we found was that only a quarter of the eyes had no power in them in terms of sphere and cylinder, and that 60% of them with it were within a half diopter. So, you know, by and large, more than half, about 60%, you won't get a sphere cylinder error induced by your trans PRK. That's the majority, which means that it's harder to identify which eyes would have done worse because they were either going to get a myopization or hypermetropization because of the epithelial thickness profile. But it does mean that 40% of the eyes will be slightly worse than if you just took the epithelium off and treated the refraction of the eye and let the epithelium grow back with the same dynamics that it was there present before because of the eyelid forces that we talked about earlier. So the logic in trans-PRK for all eyes is very flawed at the moment because the technology is not there to be able to do three-dimensional epithelial modeling and include this into the ablation profile. When we look at the a review of the literature on trans-PRK, um, like a lot of literature, you, you know, not all of it is, is um, well, you have to look at it with a, a pinch of salt sometimes because there are studies that show that it is absolutely better no matter what, with outcomes, haste, pain, recovery, everything's better. And then there are studies that show that basically it's the same or that it's slightly better if you do alcohol. And these are all different populations of eyes, different number of cases. Um, and so, and some, sometimes it's one group of patients versus another group, and sometimes it's one eye versus the other eye. So you can see, though, looking at the table just simplistically, that essentially they're kind of the same 
in terms of outcomes and haze, and possibly it's faster recovery, uh, maybe a little bit less pain. But uh, my, my PRK patients don't have pain because we we give dilute anesthetic and we give oral medication to make sure that they don't have pain. So that we, we we don't consider that to be an issue. So I don't believe that trans PRK for all eyes is really the best option. I think it's necessary for some eyes, and we use PRK whenever there's a disease on the cornea, like basement membrane dystrophy, recurrent erosion syndrome, a scar from a contact lens uh, infection, which you want to wipe out at the same time as fixing the refractive error. Now, one of the only um, direct comparisons of SMILE versus uh, TransPRK was done by David Kang. I was involved in study design and, and, and edit editorial work, so it, it's really David Kang's work, this study. And um, what he compared was, you know, let's say gold standard of one, uh, which would be wavefront guided, corneal wavefront guided TransPRK versus SMILE, which is not wavefront guided at all, and it's spherical, and there's nothing, there's nothing fancy about the lenticule removal. And what was interesting here was that there was no difference in efficacy between the two procedures. Uh, there was no difference in safety between the two procedures. There was, except possibly more eyes lost one line. Um, there was about the same accuracy between the two procedures, and you see the nomograms are fairly similar. The R squared, the scatter of the results was similar. And the accuracy was the same, and, and the cylinder correction was about the same for both groups. Now, when we looked at the higher order aberrations though, what's interesting is that there was more coma uh, induced um, in SMILE, which you would have ex expected it to be in, PR, in trans-PRK because of what I said earlier, but these are small differences. And we do know that the biomechanics of SMILE do create a bit of a coma induction, usually inferior, inferior steepening. Um, and it's not related to centration, actually. It's something biomechanical that we don't quite understand yet. But here, the big enemy in refractive surgery is spherical aberration. I'm going to talk about that a lot for the rest of the, uh, the seminar. Spherical aberration is the essentially the enemy. If that goes too high, then we have night vision problems and loss of contrast. And the corneal wavefront guided treatment, trans-PRK, induced much more spherical aberration than smile and, and 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 we're going to talk about why later but that is for me an important factor as far as higher order in general it was still high more higher orders in trans transprk than smile overall and this is interesting because even though the prk treatment here was corneal wavefront guided the smile induced less higher order aberrations as a whole so there isn't really evidence to suggest that trans-PRK is the best procedure for all eyes. I've touched upon this idea of the wavefront, right? The corneal wavefront. Well, let's talk about the whole eye wavefront because there is a company that started and still says that wavefront guided is the best procedure for all eyes. And I'm going to go for the jugular on this one because um, wavefront guided surgery might be very good for all eyes that don't have a large angle kappa. Because the whole eye wavefront by convention is calculated from the center of the pupil. And if you have a large angle kappa, that means that, you know, to an approximation, that's the Purkinje image of the coaxially fixating eye. And as we know now, more and more people are finally convinced that centering refractive surgery on the corneal vertex is better than centering it on the center of the pupil because of these angle kappa cases. And let me give you some examples where this has gone quite wrong. Um, you can see these hyperopic ablations, which are very decentered and very symptomatic in this patient. This patient had wavefront guided LASIK. And you can see from their image of the pupil that the angle kappa is huge. And there is a, a very well-centered ablation on the pupil center because of angle, you know, angular and, 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 and XYZ tracking, no problem. Perfectly centered on the pupil, but very poorly centered 
on the visual axis of this patient. And therefore, this patient comes for a topography guided repair to recenter everything onto their original uh, vertex. Uh, here's another example where the surgeon did hyperopic wavefront guided LASIK, and then they did an enhancement as a wavefront guided because the patient was complaining of night vision. Then they did another enhancement again, and they hammered this off center uh, uh, shift of the vertex of this cornea. And of course, again, a, way, a topography guided treatment is used to recenter things onto the visual axis. And here's the, the 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 real kicker about wavefront guided that I would I, I would throw at you, and that is, why even consider adding higher order aberrations, considering that most virgin eyes don't have anything beyond the minuscule amount of higher order aberrations that aren't causing problems. This was a marketing deception introduced into the field that the, adding the higher order aberrations of a patient will improve the post-op outcomes. And it was a really uh, deceptive concept because we started with spherical aberrations, which were from Barraquer, and the modified Barraquer formula that Munnerlin rearranged it. So it's called the Munnerlin equation. And we, 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 we thought that adding these little fairy dust additions to the top, which are these little higher order aberrations, is going to give us a better chance of 2020. And what they found when they first did the trials of, of adding this little fairy dust on was that the results were actually worse than just the sphere. And this was because these tiny little aberrations were buried in a sea of increased spherical aberration. When this was recognized, peripheral ablation was increased on the base profile making the profiles aspheric, which some companies called wavefront optimized and some other companies called aberration smart ablation profile. So adding peripheral ablation reduced the induction of spherical aberration. And yet then the fairy dust higher orders may or may not make any difference. So the old argument about which is better, wavefront guided or wavefront optimized, the only difference between these two in the end was the little higher order aberrations at the top. And the fact is that for the vast majority of eyes, as I just showed you, these little higher order aberrations are so little that it's crazy going for them because you're in corneal surgery, you're inducing higher order aberrations but through biomechanics and healing wound healing factors anyway. So this argument that was quintessential in the mid 2000s was was really a, a, a waste of time there was a company the, the both companies were essentially doing the same thing and one was arguing that the other was doing something that was less good yes there will be cases where the wavefront guided treatment will be better because there's a small angle kappa and there might be an eye which has a is, is you know at the, at the at the tip of this distribution you might have an eye here that has a lot of trefoil or an eye that has a lot of spherical aberration. And yes, those eyes would benefit from the extra you know, treatment. But as you can see from this uh, you know, rather large sample of 250 patients' eyes, it, it, it doesn't matter most of the time. So again, is wavefront guided surgery the best procedure for all eyes? I would argue no. Let's move on to topography guided, because what we really mean by this is topography is wavefront guided, the wavefront of the cornea. And the, I had access to this in 2005, a very high resolution um, uh, topographer called the Atlas and a very high resolution laser called the MEL-80. And these were linked. And I had the option of doing topography guided treatments of virgin eyes. Uh, and I did so actually um, initially, but I stopped doing them when I remembered that in 2001, Pablo Artal and David Williams showed that the whole eye aberrations are usually lower than the corneal or internal separately. And what this means is that the internal aberrations were being partially compensated for by corneal aberrations, almost canceling each other out so that the whole eye aberrations were lower and nature is very clever. It's interesting that that happens. 
But this, of course, tells you how illogical it is to remove the corneal high order aberrations and leave the internal aberrations exposed so that the total eye aberrations end up worse than they were when they were being um, compensated for, if you like. So again, it doesn't make any sense to treat corneal aberrations if you're gonna expose internal aberrations. And remember, most eyes have very little in the way of whole eye aberrations. The other question that comes up, which, which actually is, was initially a problem for recommending corneal surgery, uh, corneal wafer guided surgery for everyone, is that the cylinder on the cornea often is not coaxial with the cylinder of the manifest refraction. And Noel Alpins described this as ocular residual astigmatism. And then there's the question about what are you going to do about it? Because you can have, you, it, it, most eyes have a very small ORA difference between the manifest and the corneal, but some eyes have a large ORA. You can have, you know, a, a 150 in the refraction, but 2.6 in the cornea, and they might be at different axes. So this is going to be a very large ocular residual astigmatism. And then what do you do? Well, you've got option one, which is just forget about the cornea, just treat the manifest refraction. And so at the end of the case, the cornea will be left with the same amount of astigmatism that is inside the eye, the, the, the uh, ocular residual astigmatism. And Noel Alpins says that patients see less well if there's astigmatism on the cornea, even if there's no refractive astigmatism. That's a theory and it hasn't been shown yet to be true. I haven't seen evidence, strong evidence for that. The other option is to, you know, just say, well, let's make the cornea spherical. And if you do that, you're going to leave cylinder in the manifest refraction equal to the pre-op ORA. Neither of those is right. Noel suggested that we should be splitting the difference and treating somewhere in between 60-40, 50-50, or 40-60. And that somehow magically the brain is going to adapt to this and see better than if you left the manifest refraction on zero. Now, I don't I don't subscribe to this. I don't think that there is evidence in the literature yet that this is true for all eyes. And and we've certainly done. Tim Archer, uh, my research manager, has done a an extensive analysis of our large database of astigmatism, and we concluded that there was only maybe possibly some benefit in to doing some vector um, planning if there is very high ORA, but this is a very rare occasion. And very high ORA is rare. So in other words, is topography guided treatment for virgin eyes the best treatment for most eyes out there? Well, again, I would conclude no. And so I think that the marketing push that we've seen, particularly from one of the companies, even though there are other companies that can offer topography guided, no one else has been pushing this. And, and I, I, I believe that this is not necessarily the smartest way to go for all eyes. I do believe that ORA is a, is, is a real element. And I, and I see cases where the refraction does not match the wavefront in terms of cylinder and the cornea, and there is ORA, and the back surface of the cornea is, does not have the astigmatism, so it must be in the lens, I get it. But often it's because we missed the refraction uh, pre-op being, uh, and we, what we do is we use the ORA as a double check. If the ORA is, is high, then we suspect probably we didn't refract the patient properly pre-op. So that's, for us, that's the, that's the first thing that we use ORA for. We calculate ORA on every patient before we treat them. If the ORA is high, whoo, we go back and make absolutely sure that we can push the sill into the direction of reducing ORA. The other part where you get ORAs that are well, high is when there it, it's actually a an artifact of the fact that the keratometry, the SIMK, is calculated from the three millimeter zone only. And if you have asymmetric topography, you can get Ks that don't really represent corneal power, and you can get a, a false sense that there is high ORA in the eye. So abnormal topography is the second reason why there might be a high ORA, and that can happen, for example, in a large angle kappa eye. Um, and the third situation, let's say, is the true ORA. And here's a, a patient who had a refraction of minus three, minus 250, cataract, best corrected 2032. We did the cataract surgery and put in a spherical lens. 
and the patient end up doing great because they didn't have astigmatism on their cornea, even though their ORA was very, very high. And if had we done a vector planning of this and put a toric lens in, we would have left the patient with cylinder in their refraction. So again, topography guided, wavefront guided surgery for all eyes, I don't think so. Do I think it's good for some eyes? Absolutely. Let's look at this case. 47 year old male, spherical refraction 26, but slightly low contrast and actually on direct questioning with a little white dot at the end of the room, the patient describes ghosting down into the left with their best spectacle corrected. So symptomatic higher order aberrations. Now, do I go straight away and do a topography guided treatment in this patient? No, of course not. This could be keratoconus. So just going in and, and just rat, just automatically doing topography guided treatment in irregular corneas can only be done if you prove that it's not keratoconus. So how do you do that? You look at the back surface, you look at whether there's elevation, you look at parameters such as the, the, the ambrosia parameters, the Ds, but really you should be looking at the epithelial thickness profile. And there are three or four OCT devices and an ultrasound device on the market that can all measure epithelium adequately to be able to show that the epithelium is thicker in that region of the inferior steepening. And therefore, this is not keratoconus. And therefore, we can go ahead and do a topography guided treatment. This patient, six years later, was still 2016 with a great refraction. And you can see the, uh, the mirror image of the difference map um, where we regularize this cornea. And actually, this patient with this ablation pro profile that's slightly asymmetric did experience an increase in contrast and quality of vision. So here's an example where we have a virgin eye where we would use topography guided. And here's another example of a patient that was plano minus two with amblyopia, and we fixed the asymmetry in the cornea. We got the coma way down from 3.7 to 1.73 Zydel, um, but you know the patient was amblyopic, so uh, there wasn't a, a huge, but perhaps it was a small benefit on contrast. But anyway, the cornea is is a lot more symmetrical than when we were very happy for ourselves. But um, I would just say that you know topography guided treatment for all virgin eyes just not a good idea. So we're back to this question of why there was a debate between wavefront guided and wavefront optimized, and it was really to do with the spherical aberration and why these two, this argument was moot is that both companies were compensating for the induction of spherical aberration and they were competing on a minor topic of whether an eye had unusually high higher order aberrations to start with. And this brings us into SMILE because the corneal strength characteristics of SMILE, the SMILE procedure, which we've been through many times in other lectures and, and publications, because the anterior cornea is stronger than the posterior cornea, and because a lamellar cut does not change the tensile strength of the cornea practically at all compared to a side cut, we now know, and it's generally accepted, there have been a number of studies, this is from our own data, that SMILE leaves the cornea with more tensile strength than LASIK for the same correction. And about 28% more tensile strength. And why is that? Because we are not taking the stronger part of the cornea away, the front of the cornea. We're only taking weaker cornea away to make the change in refraction. And why is it that the corneal strength makes lace, makes smile an, advanta an advantageous treatment? Well, it's not because it leaves the cornea stronger. In other words, you don't do smile because it leaves the cornea stronger. That's not why you do SMILE, because if that was the case, you could do SMILE, that would have said that LASIK has a problem, and LASIK doesn't have a problem. You can do as much LASIK as you want. You stick to the rules, no ectasia. But it's the advantage that we have on corneal strength that allows us to use larger optical zones. And so we use larger optical zones with SMILE than we do with LASIK, wavefront guided, wavefront optimized. And because we use larger optical zones, that's why we get less induction of spherical aberration. So a six millimeter zone smile induces a certain amount of spherical aberration, 6.5 induces less, seven induces even less. 
And if you compare these to a six millimeter wavefront guided wavefront optimized treatment, you actually induce less spherical aberration with SMILE in the same zone, and you're taking less tissue out. There's less biomechanical expansion in the periphery because the mechanics are less disturbed. And if you use a larger optical zone with SMILE, you induce even less spherical aberration. And even if you do a seven millimeter SMILE, you're leaving way less spherical aberration in the cornea than with LASIK. You're taking more tissue out, but you're still leaving the cornea with the equal or more tensile strength that you would have with LASIK. So the advantage of SMILE is the corneal strength characteristics allowing us to use larger optical zones and therefore re inducing less spherical aberration for the same refraction. 65% less spherical aberration with SMILE than with LASIK in matched controls. And others have shown the same thing. Sri Ganesh, uh, Yabo Yang and, and her group have shown the same thing, that SMILE induces less spherical aberration than LASIK. And of course, the advantages of corneal nerve, um, avoidance of the corneal nerve plexus and the uh, you know, recovery of corneal sensation, the fact that we're not cutting the plexus of nerves in the cap with SMILE and that the dry eye recovery is faster and the fact that um, you know, there's, there isn't a flap, there's no moving parts, patient can return to their uh, Aikido Taekwondo lesson the next day. All of that are nice things, but the real advantage is spherical aberration induction is reduced. And of course, the outcomes of SMILE, these are Kishore Pradhan's um, uh, results. As you know, he trained as a fellow with us at London Vision Clinic, and he went back to Nepal, and we analyzed his first 1,364 consecutive eyes, including his learning curve after a fellowship with us, and he had 97, 95% 2020 for myopia up to minus 10. And th now we're talking about high myopia, we're you know, on the subject of high spherical aberration. We uh, at the London Vision Clinic did a, a physician-sponsored study for Zeiss, uh, where we looked at uh, using SMILE for very high myopia, from minus nine to minus 13. And everyone talks about this being a bad thing because night vision problems, and night vision problems are spherical aberration. So in this group, we now have, for most of the patients now, collected the, the patient satisfaction data from three and 12 months. And you can see that the patient satisfaction is actually very, very high in these patients. Now, remember this in the context of the symptoms of, of spherical aberration. So when we talk about glare, halo, starburst, double image, distorted image, halo, all of these symptoms, these night vision symptoms, which are to do with higher order aberrations. And then we qualify them as being not bothersome, a little bit bothersome, quite bothersome, or very bothersome. You see that most patients are very satisfied and only have a little bit of bothersome or not bothersome symptoms. Patients who have very bothersome symptoms were 10%, that was three. Um, but despite that, their satisfaction is very high. So you see, very bothersome, but highly satisfied. And this eye, which was the worst, actually was a slight undercorrection about minus one. And when we corrected the minus one, the form was changed to a satisfaction of 10 out of 10. So as you can see, the satisfaction rates and the symptom rates are not fully co uh, um, uh, um, uh, what you would expect. And, and another way of, of, of corroborating this is to say, well, look at multifocal diffractive IOLs. They have halos and glare and starbursts, and 40% of patients will report them, but their patient satisfaction is still high. Okay. So is SMILE the procedure of choice for every single patient? No, not every single patient, but can you do it in high myopia? Yes. But is it for all high myopia patients? No, because they might have thinner corneas, they might have started with higher levels of spherical aberration, and so you can't actually drive the spherical aberration into these toxic levels because you will compromise um, the quality of vision. So what do we do then? Well, that is where the ICL comes in. And the ICL, um, which, you know, as you know, gives phenomenal outcomes because as accurate as you are at refraction, that's basically what you're going to get in your results because the accuracy, well, let's put it this way. The ICL 
is a piece of plastic, which is, you know, not the same as the cornea. So you really do get what you, what, what, what you prescribe. And so the results are phenomenal. The accuracy is tremendous. The safety is tremendous. But of course, remember that um, although laser eye surgery is much more popular in terms of a practice surgical procedure, the ICL people are saying that, well, you know, you should be doing this on everybody because it's better quality of vision. Well, let's look at that. I mean, to do laser eye surgery, the barrier to entry is huge. You've got to spend three quarters of a million euros on equipment, lasers, service contracts. You've got to do a fellow, if you want to do it right, you do a fellowship training, you, you know, get a lot, it takes a long, it, call it a million euros of investment. Whereas to do fake ILL surgery, as long as you're an ophthalmologist, you can already do cataract surgery. So it's, there's no barrier to entry. It's like basically an open door with the key in the door. And perhaps you might want to invest in some ultrasound to get better sizing, but that's a very low bar of entry. And so it's surprising that the market is divided in this direction because essentially cataract surgeons are 100 times more abundant than corneal refractive surgeons. And technically speaking, the ICL, I think, or that kind of technology should have two thirds of the market um, because doctors are often able to convince patients on what procedure to do, even if the facts aren't quite straight. And we're back to the marketing again. Marketing the ICL as a better option for patients who would have been candidates for corneal refractive surgery, I think is disingenuous because if you're a good candidate for corneal, dis corneal refractive surgery, you're offering the patient a lower risk procedure and and trying to exaggerate the effects of higher order aberrations in the cornea and trying to scare cataract surgeons into not being able to do cataract surgery after corneal refractive surgery i think this is all overblown and unfair because it's not true and we do a lot of cataract surgery in post lasik eyes and we get excellent outcomes we you know you've got the barrett universal with true k you get amazing predictability uh, with eye well calculations now. So I, I think, again, marketing and science and refractive surgery are really things that we have to, as physicians, really question. Um, you know, the, the, of all the complications of IS, ICL surgery, most of them are to do with the sizing. And as I said, if you have sizing based on ultrasound, you're measuring the actual location where the lens is going to go and therefore you're more likely to get better sizing. Um, and our formula uh, is, is, is now showing that we get way better predictability of, this, of the volt of the ICL um, than if we were to just use um, you know, external measurements to predict the internal. So here's a perspective series of eyes treated with the formula that we derived from high frequency ultrasound parameters. And as you can see, the interquartile range, which is about 250 for uh, just plain equations that estimate the, the, the uh, posterior chamber dimensions, if you use parameters of the posterior chamber, you can greatly reduce the interquartile range and possibly eliminate the need for an exchange surgery to, in fact, possibly completely eliminate that. We're now able to plot intended volt versus achieved volt. That's how accurate this thing is. We're getting 91% of the eyes within 300 microns of where we thought we would get them in the eye. So the ICL is a bulletproof um, uh, 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 refractive surgery where the complication rates can be greatly uh, reduced or almost virtually eliminated by taking care of the sizing but yet it's still better to stay on the cornea if you can, uh, because it's by definition going inside the eyes always gonna be higher risk than in an appropriately chosen corneal surgery. So we, we, we've set up iclsizing.com for people to use this. So just to, to finalize this so that you, you, you see what I do, what we're doing in our practice, and this is an analysis of the last two years, because if I gave you the statistics on this year's, it wouldn't change it, because we obviously aren't doing much surgery this year uh, for, for tragic reasons. Um, but we do very little PRK. We don't do any trans-PRK. We do PTKs for repairing eyes, but we don't do trans-PRK. And we do less, well less than 1% PRK, because we have access to SMILE and LASIK, which are far superior procedures for the patient. We do no wavefront guided surgery in the last two years. We didn't have a case where it was necessary. 
we've done less than 1% topo guided in primary eyes that needed the boost of the higher orders on the cornea. They weren't, they weren't uh, negatively affected by internal aberrations, and there wasn't a, a discrepancy between the ORA refractive and corneal astigmatism. Of our myopic cases, 75% are smiled. So this is not 100%, it's 75%. But it is a big, big majority are smiled. And, and why do we do a lot of LASIK still in myopia? Well, because we do presbyon. And presbyon uh, makes sure that the spherical aberration and depth of field is controlled. And smile monovision is only similar to presbyon in the higher range. So about minus six to minus nine, smile behaves similar to presbyon. But for the lower, especially up to minus three, smile doesn't perform as well as presbyon. So we do LASIK for those patients. And for the patients that we cannot safely operate on the cornea, we will then pass on to ICL. And about one, we do a very several thousand procedures a year. So we do a lot of ICLs, but it's only 1% of our surgery and we're very happy with it. So I hope that uh, that overall um, uh, synopsis gives you an idea of my impression of the marketing tools that have been used to influence our decision process and I hope that this lecture gives you an idea how to perhaps approach each of these techniques, which may be appropriate for a particular patient, but rather understand that there is not one technique that is supposed to be the best idea for all eyes. Thank you. Thank you very much.